Okay, assalamu alaikum. Today I'm going to be talking about the developmental abnormalities of the spinal cord and this presentation is presented by Amal of Madison on the 7th of November of the year 2013. Before starting to talk about the developmental abnormalities in specific, we have to understand the embryology of the spinal cord. Something to keep in mind that the neural plate has to invaginate in order to form the neural tube. And this neural tube is going to be forming from the cranial end to the caudal end of the fetus. So it's going to be from the head to the lower back. And if any failure of closure of this neural tube occurred at either the cranial or the caudal aspect, this is going to lead to a neural tube defect. Okay, so neural tube defects. What is the pathogenesis of the neural tube defect? It could be either because of the failure of the fusion of the lateral folds of the neural plate or could be because of the rupture of previously closed neural tube. How can I detect that this mother is carrying a baby having a neural tube defect? Usually, you can detect that by an increased maternal alpha fetoprotein in the serum or in the amniotic fluid. Okay? And something to always keep in mind that neural tube defects are highly associated with low folate levels prior to conception. What are some examples of neural tube defects? We have anencephaly, spina bifida, cerebral aqueduct stenosis, dandy walkle malformation, or Arnold Chiari malformation, and we're going to be discussing these malformations in this presentation. We're going to start with anencephaly. The basic problem about anencephaly is that there is a failure of the closure that practically occurs at the cranial aspect. And because it occurs at the cranial aspect of the neural tube, this is going to lead to the absence of the skull and the absence of a brain, leading to something which is usually described as the frog-like appearance of the baby. Why do we describe the baby as a frog-like appearance? We basically do that because in anencephaly, the eyes are going to be very prominent and there is an absence of the brain, absence of a skull, which makes the baby more like a frog. Another very important correlation to remember when it comes to anencephaly is that anencephaly is associated with a condition called the polyhydraminose. What is polyhydraminose? Polyhydraminose is a condition where we're going to have excess amniotic fluid in the amniotic sac. And to understand that more theoretically, you have to remember that the baby is usually surrounded by amniotic fluid. At the same time, the baby's amniotic fluid is made up of the baby's urine. And the baby needs to swallow some of the amniotic fluid and resorb it. Now, in a condition such as anencephaly, there is absence of a brain, meaning that we're going to have an absence of the CNS swallowing center. So the baby cannot really swallow the amniotic fluid, leading to increased amniotic fluid, which is a condition called the polyhydraminose. So remember, anencephaly is going to be associated with polyhydraminose. The second anomaly we're going to be talking about is the spina bifida. Spina bifida is a condition where we're going to be having failure of neural tube to close at the caudal aspect. Or in other words, it's the failure of the posterior vertebral arch to close. We can have many forms of spina bifida. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about three. The first one is called spina bifida oculata. Now, in spina bifida oculata, there is a small defect or gap in one or more vertebrae of the spine. Now, in other words, you could see that in spina bifida oculata, there is going to be a formation of a dimple or a patch of hair overlying the vertebral defect. Another form of spina bifida is going to be called the meningocele. Meningocele is a very form, a rare form of cyst, but in this form of cyst, you're going to have a cyst containing the meninges. So it could be practically surgically remove, removed in order to allow normal development. Proceeding to the most severe form of spina bifida is called the myelomeningocele, sometimes also called the meningeomyelocele. In this case, the unfused part of the spinal cord is going to protrude into the opening. 
and the opening is going to be having the meningeal membranes that cover the spinal cord together with the spinal cord or with the nerve roots of the spinal cord. It could be surgically corrected, yet it's not going to be correcting the entire problem. Like, I could remove this sac from the baby, yet I'm going to have other complications. I'm going to have complications like paralysis, bladder, and bowel control. This might be a very serious problem after the surgery as well. So this is an image to show you the difference between meningeal myelocelli and meningeal meningocelli. You can see in meningeal cell, only the meninges are going to be protruding in this sac. So removing it won't really lead to complications as the complications that meningeal myelocell surgery removal would lead to. Because you can see that the spinal cord with the meninges are going to be involved in the sac. The third anomaly we're going to be talking about this is the cerebral aqueduct stenosis. Before talking about this anomaly, I want to refresh your memory regarding the CN CSF, cerebral spinal fluid uh, production. Uh, you have to remember that the choroid plexus in the ventricles is going to make the CSF. Then this is going to be going to the lateral ventricles, from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricles via the foramen of Monroe. And then from the third ventricles to the fourth ventricles via the cerebral aqueduct. So in case we're going to be having cerebral aqueduct stenosis, you won't be really able to drain the CSF. So the CSF is going to accumulate within the ventricles, and this is going to lead to enlargement of the ventricles, which is a condition called hydrocephalus. And if the cerebral aqueduct stenosis occurred in children and in infants, I mean newborns, you're going to be having an increase in the diameter of the head circumflex because of the hydrocephalus. So I found this website online, uh, which I placed the reference on the bottom of my slide. It has lots of images, um, MRIs and CDs and so on, regarding the cerebral aqueduct stenosis. I think that it's going to be uh, really interesting if you went through them. Another point to keep in mind that the aqueduct stenosis is the most common cause of congenital obstructive hydrocephalus. The fourth anomaly we're going to be talking about is the dandy walkel malformation. dandy walkel malformation is a congenital failure of the developing cerebellar vermis. The cerebellar vermis is going to be separating between the two sides of the cerebellum. Usually patients with dandy walker are going to be presented with massively dilated fourth ventricle with an absent cerebellum, often accompanied with hydrocephalus. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that they have hypothesized that this anomaly or malformation could be a result from a rest in the cerebellar development prior to the third month. These are images of a patient has, having dandy walker. You could see the hydrocephalus, the enlarged diameter of the head. And here you could see the enlarged ventricles or the dilated ventricles because of the hydrocephalus. The last anomaly we're going to be talking about is called the arnold Chiari malformation. arnold Chiari malformation is a caudal extension of the medulla and the cerebral vermis through the foramen magnum. Now, I want you to keep in mind that arnold Chiari could be of two types. It could be of type 1 or it could be of type 2. Type 1 is not usually uh, with much significance because most of the time it has not much symptoms. Whereas in type 2, we're going to have obstruction of the CSF flow leading to hydrocephalus. And usually it may occur with association of meningeal myelocelli, which we already discussed previously in the spina bifida. It's going to be the case where the meninges and the spinal cord are going to be protruding in the sac. And the other condition is called the syringeal myelia. Syringeal myelia is a degenerative disease of the spinal cord. And the treatment of arnold Chiari type 2 usually is by a compression surgery.
So um, this ends our presentation about the developmental anomalies of the spinal cord. My references have been the Pathoma videos and the Pathology Rapid Review 3rd edition. If you have any questions, any feedbacks, any inquiries, or anything you would like to say, comments or anything, just don't hesitate to contact me at amelofmedicine at gmail.com. I hope you found this video beneficial and you enjoyed it. Have a wonderful day and thank you for watching. Salam alaikum.